So our poll question today is going to be how, what's the percentage of Americans that experience fatigue? So if you have a guess, feel free to enter it into the poll on the chat. There are no wrong answers. No guesses, you guys? Well, I'm gonna jump in and we'll just get started. So there's a lot of variation um, between the data that's come out for how many, you know, what the percentage is that Americans um, experience fatigue, but there's um, there's some studies that say as low as 7%, which I would say is a pretty low amount and up to 45%. So in our practice, fatigue is something that often comes up um, for patients and it can be a, a instigating factor for people, one of their main reasons for seeking care. And so it's a really important topic. So we're gonna get started. I am Dr. Molly Force, and I am the clinical director here at Prosper Natural Health. I've got Dr. Rosalie and Dr. Mary who are with me today, and we're gonna be going through information about fatigue, as you all know, and ways to really help optimize energy. This is such a very broad topic. We're gonna to be really wanting to talk about different root causes and things that you need to be considering when you're wanting to address fatigue and energy levels. So our goals today are gonna to be to help you guys understand how to recognize fatigue. I mean, it's something that we feel in our bodies, so it's to some degree subjective, but recognizing when the body is trying to communicate with us that we're experiencing fatigue and how that can play out for your health. And then we want you guys to be able to understand different ways that we can evaluate and really measure, kind of quantify um, and monitor fatigue for yourself. And then we also want to make sure that you have some really good understandings for ways that you can naturally be supporting your health um, by really focusing in on ways to reduce fatigue and enhance energy. So the first concept here is this idea of energy. And of course, when we have lots and lots of energy, we tend to have the cells in our body communicating the way we want them to. We tend to get better metabolic um, input in the body and better communication all around. So that equates for us a healthier brain activity. And when we have a healthier brain activity, we have the ability to have that brain communicate to all those peripheral tissues and find homeostasis or balance for our body much better. This also leads to better cognitive function, um, the ability to react to stimulus quickly and appropriately, and the, the ability to recover quicker as well. And all of those factors really reduce our risk of disease. So we want to be over here in this area of efficient energy production. The scale slides downwards to the point where we're experiencing more significant fatigue and our energy slumps. And that's where we start to see these syndromes that come up, these fatigue patterns that come up. And with that, there's a direct correlation with pain syndromes and disordered uh, brain function. So we have mood disorders that come into that as well as brain uh, degeneration. So neurodegeneration. Generation. We also find in that category the disruption of our cellular behavior that can even lead to things like cancer, and then some of our more chronic inflammatory diseases. So that's the camp of cardiovascular disease. So we really want our patients and our community to be moving away from that, that lower energy, the more taxed, um, imbalanced setting to having enough of that energy potential to be really able to appropriately respond to stressors as they come up in life. 
So when we're thinking about energy, we're thinking about our cells producing energy with these cool um, components called mitochondria. And mitochondria is kind of known as the powerhouse of the cell. And its job is to produce energy in the form, the cellular form of energy is called ATP. So this is what the cells use as energy. And we really want to have a good understanding of this cellular connection because that affects us on a core level. And there are different categories, like we were talking about with that scale on the last page of fatigue. So fatigue can be intermittent where it comes and goes, or it can become chronic as we kind of slide down that scale and become something that happens like chronic fatigue syndrome, which is more continuous. And then we get into that category of chronic dysregulation or chronic illness. So when we're thinking about these changes, these physiologic changes that happen, there are several triggers that can push us into these um, energy disorder pathways. And some of the most common ones that we know, according to the research that can really deplete our mitochondria or remember those powerhouses of the cell are viral infections. Some of these can be chronic tissue trauma. So that could be from a car crash or having um, an actual burn or some kind of tissue trauma that includes having brain injuries. We know different diseases that affect our organs can really affect our ability to um, produce proper energy from the mitochondria. And we know autoimmune diseases are also connected in there for depleting mitochondrial output. So when we're talking about mitochondria, and I know we're kind of getting small here, but we want to start small and then build from there. There are some things that we need for this proper cellular function. So without these basic, what we call precursor or building blocks, we can't have normal function of these cells. And what that means for us is we can't have normal energy. So we want to make sure we have these base building blocks so that the cells can do their job and produce the energy that they require for normal function. So these precursors, we've broken them down very simply here for you guys. We've got glucose or sugar. We also have ketones, which can be seen by the cells as energy um, precursors, and then oxygen. So we require those three items in order to help the mitochondria do its job. The mitochondria portion of the cells also require these cofactors. So these cofactors are often vitamins or minerals that can be found, um, that can be um, ingested by us that help our the help the building blocks needed for the mitochondria to do their chemical production of the energy. So we've got B vitamins one, two, and three there. We've got alpha linoleic acid, which is an antioxidant. We'll talk about that. Carnitine, which is an amino acid, vitamin C, which many of you are familiar with, of course, vitamin K as well. And then we've got these two minerals, calcium and magnesium. So all of these are important to have in the body so that we can produce that um, proper energy through the mitochondria. And then we have antioxidants, and we're going to talk specifically about glutathione today. But that's one of the best researched antioxidant that works at that cellular level to help the mitochondria do its job. And once we have all those building blocks, we can produce the ATP. So the takeaway here is that if you're not keeping your blood sugar balanced and having adequate nutrition that includes some of these cofactors, then we're gonna have a problem with our energy production. If you're not getting enough oxygen, for example, we're gonna have problems with our energy production. And if you don't have the proper amount of antioxidants on board, like the glutathione, then we're gonna have an issue with energy production. Okay, so next we're gonna talk all about hormones and how they relate to energy and energy regulation. 
So we're going to discuss female hormones, thyroid hormones, as well as cortisol and melatonin. So our sex hormones can have a profound impact on our energy levels. And we can see that throughout um, the menstrual cycle and throughout the course of the lifespan. So energy levels can vary as estrogen rises and progesterone rises. And then um, we particularly notice it in the menstrual cycle right before menses when people often feel really low energy when their hormones are the lowest. Um, and we also see a decline or an overall decline in energy levels after menopause when, when estrogen and progesterone have decreased. On a cellular level, all of these hormones affect energy regulation by promoting the growth of new mitochondria and promoting ATP production. And specifically, estrogen can act on, well, it directly com communicates with the hypothalamus to affect our energy expenditure and fat distribution. So it affects our, our impulse to consume energy as well as our um, ability, as well as the way that we, our cells utilize glucose and fatty acids and turn them into usable energy. So thyroid hormones have a significant impact on our energy levels. And they're one of the main ways that our body regulates energy, hunger, and metabolism. So if you've had your thyroid hormones tested before, you're probably familiar with the terms TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone, T3, and T4. So the role of TSH is to, is to stimulate the thyroid to secrete what are actual thyroid hormones that work on our tissues and regulate our energy levels and, um, and fuel metabolism. And the, it's important to distinguish between T3, which is the active form of our thyroid hormone, and T4, which is the most common form of our thyroid hormone that circulates in our body and is waiting for us to need more energy and to get that signal to convert to T3 so that T3 can then act on our cells to increase glucose absorption and mobilize and increase the metabolism of glucose and fatty acids to, to give us usable energy. Now, cortisol is our, also known as our stress hormone. It does a number of things in our body, including um, decreasing or modulating our inflammatory response. So as cortisol levels rise, our cytokine and immune cell stimulation decreases. It also increases blood sugar. So it gets us ready in the morning to be to get up and be active, productive humans. Um, and part of that is, is releasing blood sugar into our bloodstream. It can help increase our sodium to potassium ratio, um, which can help regulate our blood pressure and it affects our sleep. So it's important to have a diurnal or a um, a, a cycle for cortisol release that changes throughout the day. So when we wake up and often when we see sunshine, um, we have a rise in our cortisol levels. And ideally those cortisol levels will slowly decrease throughout the day and be the lowest when we're ready to go to bed. And then they'll increase again in the morning when we're ready to wake up. Melatonin, on the other hand, has um, a sort of inverse pattern from, from cortisol. So melatonin is our sleep hormone. It's secreted by the pineal gland, um, which is at the base of our brain. And it 
is low throughout the day and then spikes um, in the evening right before bedtime. So these two hormones act in concert with each other to help us awake in, and then help us get ready for sleeping. And both of these, the, the daytime awakening response and the nighttime sleep are important for us to have a balanced energy level. So to um, feel energetic throughout the day and then to rest and rejuvenate in the evening. So when we're thinking about causes of fatigue, you can already see that there are several different categories of root causes that can be going on for people. And sometimes they have more than one um, influencing factor from these different categories. So we can have the medical and the biochemical components, and then we can have the mental and emotional. So major issues with our melatonin causing sleep disorders, problems with our hormones, like hypothyroidism, these things can drastically affect our energy level and they can affect us on that cellular level. So we can be feeling that fatigue and it's very much a biochemical piece coming in. You can see how things like um, blood sugar can really affect our fatigue from what we discussed earlier with mitochondria needing that blood sugar stability. Also um, the hormonal changes, of course, coming in here as well. Things like um, like chemicals can disrupt the ability for the mitochondria to work. And that's a big deal for us because we think about antioxidants coming in and quenching the damage that's done from those chemicals. And that being a really important part of the mitochondrial cycle for the energy. And so we want to think about what components are really driving the fatigue. So today when we're talking about tips as far as um, ways to really strategize healing from low energy or chronic fatigue syndromes, we wanna be making sure you're taking the time to think through what might be going on specifically for you in regards to these imbalances. And this is really where we feel like naturopathic medicine shines is our job is to help our patients kind of look at the whole picture and say what areas are out of balance and what areas are playing into this energy disruption. So number one for evaluation has to do with what the patient themselves is experiencing. So once again, thinking about what it is that your body is trying to communicate. The, your body is constantly sending these signals. And if it's showing a signal of fatigue, it is showing uh, a, an imbalance that's going on that should be addressed. So looking for that being the next step, um, we always like to start as physicians with physical exam. And that's really important because there's all kinds of things that can show up in the body that can be good clues, good signs for us of imbalance and things that we might need to investigate that could be the cause of illness. Next step is after that would be blood work where we're taking some, some blood and looking at it, looking at all the organ systems. Uh, and generally that's done with an annual panel, just a default regular blood work uh, on the yearly. But we could definitely add on some markers to look for very specific things that cause fatigue that otherwise wouldn't show up on routine blood work. So the annual panels typically check for a couple key things, especially when I, when I think of fatigue, I want to make sure we're, we're ruling out anemia, a really common cause of fatigue. So your annual panel will look at your CBC, which has your red blood cells and your hematocrit in there. And that's a good way to, to check for anemia. It would also look for blood sugar levels in, uh, in a panel known as the CMP or the metabolic panel, uh, where we're looking especially at your fasting blood sugar. Fatigue can be intricately linked with, uh, with, with hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia, right? Too much sugar or too little. Same thing with cholesterol levels. 
it's it's uh, screened for in the annual panel. And then the big one is thyroid, like Dr. Mary mentioned, uh, just a thyroid screen where we check for the thyroid hormone to see whether that metabolic organ or thyroid is working well. Some add-on markers, if all of those look nice and normal, that I often see linked with fatigue is vitamin D, which in this region of the world, if you are in, in the Seattle area like ourselves, it's a chronic deficiency uh, that, that patients come in with. Inflammation markers also will clue us into the body is using too much energy to make inflammation and not leaving enough uh, for us to not feel fatigued. B12 is also huge, uh, as well as autoimmune markers. And then if we want to get into some salivary testing, uh, that's where I look at sex hormones and cortisol, especially in those transitional times of life, like menopause even. So we've sort of formulated together as, the, as our trio and of naturopaths here, a basic wellness panel that has a naturopathic perspective on that routine blood work. Um, and I think there's probably a 10 or 12 different markers that we look at, we like to check every year that is, is pretty comprehensive. Um, if, if you haven't had your annual panel, uh, it's, worth, it's worth looking into. Okay, so another way of evaluating fatigue um, in a lot of our patients is um, we will look at salivary cortisol testing. So cortisol, um, again, is that awakening hormone, is our stress hormone, and it is one that we want to see rise in the morning and decrease throughout the day. So what we do is a four point salivary test where we test first thing in the morning and then several times throughout the day and then at bedtime to make sure that it has that, that trend. Often with cortisol dysregulation, what we'll see is it will be low in the morning um, and potentially high in the evening when you want, when you're ready to go to bed that's a kind of flipped diurnal cycle that we'll wanna address. And that can be particularly present with folks who are feel really wired at night and then are exhausted all day. So the other piece that we like to look at, especially if things are coming up pretty normal on the annual panel are functional medicine tests. And what these allow us to do is really look a little bit deeper for other underlying causes. So things that can initiate inflammation can be very disruptive to this cellular communication. So we want to be thinking about allergen panels, food sensitivity panels is a really common one. We had already mentioned um, how toxic chemicals can be blocking for these cellular sim uh, signals. So for our panels that will help us look for toxic chemicals, whether they are heavy metals or plastics or other chemical um, profiles. We also like to look for pathogenic profiles. So things that could be really pulling the immune response down and causing a lot of fatigue for the body. Like we mentioned, some of the more chronic viral um, or bacterial problems can be involved in that. We also see fungal elements, of course, as well. We also sometimes will be screening for blood brain barrier assessments. And this is an important process for us if we're worried about any kind of neural inflammation. And a lot of time, especially when we're looking at chronic fatigue syndromes, we are really worried about the brain fog that people are experiencing and other signs that they might be having inflammation that could be crossing up into that um, brain, which is just so very um, concerning because it really instigates more inflammation for the body. 
We also sometimes will be looking at nutrient profile panels. And this is really once again important because we want to make sure that all those cofactors are available for the body. And this can even be helpful sometimes when we're worried about different um, forms of anemia. If, for example, it's not an iron deficiency anemia or something like that. Because once again, we want to make sure that the body is oxygenated. That's very important as part of this process. So another piece that we have that's just available kind of DIY on our website, if anyone is interested, is we do have a detox and cleanse program. Now, this is the holidays, so it's not necessarily a great time to get going with this. But come January, this can be a really helpful tool for people. And what it does is it allows you to get a shopping and meal plan and a supplement plan that will help you with detoxing and really helping to cleanse. So if you do know that the chemical element in particular is something that you're worried about, or if you're worried about your eliminatory organs, having had stress, this could be a really wonderful reset program and is something that's available on our website, something you download and you can do a self-guided um, detox through that. Or we also have a tier where we work with you as physicians on that. So we're going to talk about ways to really help with your overall energy now that we've kind of talked about the basics of fatigue. Great, so the next slide will show us about the general gist here, which has to do with mitochondrial support. And this is a topic I really love to explore with patients because essentially remember what Dr. Molly said about the mitochondria being a part of, of your, your human cells that makes energy for you. The mitochondria actually can suffer pretty greatly depending on what's going on from stress to inflammation to uh, you know chronic infections, right? So ultimately, if we want to combat fatigue as a symptom, we have to boost the mitochondrial ability. So we'll sort of keep coming back to this concept, but I want you to keep this in the back of your mind as we sort of walk through the health hacks because for mitochondria to be supported, they need adequate fuel. And that fuel is, is glucose or ketones predominantly, which are uh, both types of sugars, right? It also needs oxygen. Part of, if you think of back to biology in high school, you think back to the Krebs cycle, part of that last step of the mitochondria making energy requires an oxygen molecule. So if you're anemic with iron deficiency, for example, your body has less oxygen. You're thus less able to make uh, ATP or that energy molecule for, for the rest of your cells. Antioxidants are really important here with uh, regards to protecting the mitochondria specifically. And we'll, we'll walk through the specific ones that have good, good data uh, on being mitochondrially protective. Physical and cognitive exercises. Again, this is a, sort of a, a thing that we talk about in every doc talk, but if we're not moving our bodies, the, the, we stay in a stagnant state ultimately, which is not helping our mitochondria get the oxygen and the fuel that they need. Cognitive exercises is a key, key piece here as well because it's, it's a mind-body uh, dance where both are involved in, in making sure we are, we are uh, not experiencing fatigue. If there's low oxygen in the brain, if we're fatigued from, you know, mental, emotional stress, like depression, it's also hard to physically get out there and move our bodies, feed our mitochondria. Uh, hormonal regulation, we've already talked about, uh, namely the thyroid, but also the sex hormones are really important for uh, kind of telling the mitochondria, all right, you, you've got to do your work here. And then we will also talk through some bioenergetic nutraceuticals, which like Dr. Molly mentioned, these are the cofactors, the, the feeding uh, basic building blocks for, for the mitochondria to, to be happy. Another piece here is to improve sleep 
and normalize that circadian rhythm, which also involves stress management pieces. And lastly, a healthy diet and dietary support, including something known as intermittent fasting. That is actually something that boosts our mitochondria uh, production, curiously enough. Okay. So next we're gonna talk about sleep. So I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of yin and yang, but um, yin is kind of in a from, a, from a traditional Chinese medicine sense, yin is what allows us to be quiet and still and rejuvenate our energy levels. And yang is when we're being really active and um, out there in the world and using all of our energy. So the yin side here is sleep, and it's really an important aspect of creating that energy balance in our lives. So generally we recommend getting at least seven to nine hours of sleep. Um, in order to set yourself up to be able to sleep by the time you're ready to go to sleep, it's a great idea to keep electronics out of your room, keep them away from your, just stop using electronics at about an hour or even two hours before bedtime. That gives your brain a chance to slow down and reduces stimuli that may activate you. Keeping a schedule is really important. So rem remember before we talked about that melatonin and cortisol diurnal cycles. And it's, so we have this sort of internal rhythm that is really important um, to maintain on a daily basis so that we can, so that our bodies can, we're basically allowing our bodies to enact that daily rhythm that they want to do. Investing in a good bed and pillow is really great, just kind of giving you that ability to fall asleep and stay asleep and not waking up because your back hurts or your neck hurts. Avoiding caffeine after noon is a great idea. It takes your body a significant amount of time to process and let go of that caffeine. So noon is a, good, um, is a good aim for just stopping any caffeine intake. And then alcohol close to bedtime can actually really drastically impact your sleep. And a lot of us sort of think of it as a sedative that allows you to fall asleep easily. But what can often happen is you'll fall asleep and then wake up a few hours later once your body has processed all the sugar and the alcohol. So good one to pay attention to if you're having sleep issues. So as we were discussing before, setting a routine is key. Our bodies like routine, they use routine and biochemical pathways. So following a rhythm is a great idea. So, you know, this time of year, if you are noticing you wanna to go to bed earlier because the, the sun is going down at five, that is your body telling you that you know you have an internal clock that you're paying attention to and it's okay to follow those cycles as much as you're able to having regular food intake is really helpful so particularly eating a regular evening meal that's not too close to bedtime regular exercise and movement Exercise and movement is great for helping flush out our catecholamines and getting us ready to, um, to sleep at night and, and helping us wake up earlier in the day. And getting that routine is essential for actually getting it done and giving your body that, um, that circulation and, and um, stimulus to process fuel sources appropriately. 
again, bedtime routine, like we talked about, is really important, setting a time and sticking to it, and then waking up at a similar time every day is going to help you feel less groggy when you do wake up early. So some other things to consider is eating a substantial serving of protein with an evening meal. That is going to slow the release of blood sugar into your bloodstream and allow you to have a more even energy usage throughout the evening. Um, and that'll prevent you from waking in the middle of the night and getting and, and feeling um, and sorry for waking in the middle of the night because of your blood sugar going really low. Um, so, and then right before bed, consider dry skin brushing, doing some calming breath work, um, doing a castor oil pack where you use castor oil on your abdomen. And it's really great for helping your liver process hormones. and doing some kind of sensory activity right before bed. So some kind of massage, something that smells good, really getting into more of your animal body and quieting your mind. And then lastly, you really need to address the cause of any imbalances that are happening. So if you have blood sugar dysregulation, needing to pay attention to that. If you have something that's really on your mind and keeping you awake, getting some counseling or talking to folks about it. Um, and there's, as we've discussed, there's a host of things that can be impacting sleep. So getting to the root of it is a good idea. So one of the things to keep in mind is that we are, well, A, that our neurotransmitters can drastically affect our energy levels and that we're actively producing these neurotransmitters um, throughout the day and in the evening. So, and we also need the building blocks to these neurotransmitters to be able to have these proper diurnal patterns. So tryptophan is one of our key amino acid building blocks for producing serotonin that process is often happening throughout the day and, and adding to our energy level. And then in the evening, serotonin is used to create melatonin, which is again, that sleep hormone that helps us fall asleep. So we've already mentioned the importance of movement and fitness, but we just wanted to make sure that it was its own tip here. Um, and the reason for that is, is it affects our cortisol levels so drastically. And those cortisol levels are going to help us to do that waking activity in the morning and give us that sustained energy throughout the day. And we know that it also is going to help us with our circulation. So when we're talking about getting that information, those cofactors, um, and fuel to our peripheral extremities, especially, and up to our brain, we want to make sure we're getting that circulation. We also have the carrying of oxygen that happens and that exchange that happens when we have that movement. So things to remember, we don't want to overtrain. So we don't want to push it too much. So more is not always better for, for exercise, but we do want to be mobile creatures. So making sure that we're getting our movement in, especially those more natural movements, like our walking, our stretching, this is going to be critical, you know, for our flexibility, keeping our pain levels down. We know that movement is one of the number one things that we can do for pain and pain is very exhausting, both mental, emotionally, and physically for the body and really contributes to fatigue. We can also do little things. They call it neat is the non-exercise activity thermogenic. Genesis. This is little tricks like parking a little bit further away when you're going into a store. So you get a little, a few extra steps or sitting on a, an exercise ball instead of sitting in a standard seat that makes you engage your core. These little things that help you stay a little bit more mobile throughout the day and, and less sedentary. 
So little tricks like that can be helpful. Some of our patients also really like some of the newer technology that's come out, like the Fitbits and the exercise trackers. And this just helps them, you know, really make sure that they're getting their um, goals met as far as their movement. But one of my core pieces that we really try to incorporate here at Prosper with all of our patients is this idea that in the morning, we want to do some form of movement to stimulate that cortisol, to stimulate that diurnal cycle that Dr. Mary was just speaking about. And we really want to have some kind of calming stretching activity that happens in the evening, which will stimulate a calmer um, amount, but more circulation for the body as far as providing those, those, um, those, that chemical fuel for the body. It's very important. So our third health hack here has to do with breathing and breath work specifically. And I absolutely love this one because, you know, we talk so often in health and wellness about how much food to eat, what kinds of foods to eat, how much sleep to get, how to move, etc. And we often forget this absolutely amazing piece, which is how do we breathe? Because if we can't take a breath for three minutes, we're, we, we don't live, right? <laughs> so part of uh, combating fatigue actually has to do with retraining the breath. Um, and there's a common myth about breathing in that taking bigger, fuller breaths actually oxygenates us more and makes us less fatigued. That's not true at all. It, it has to do with how we breathe. Are we breathing deeply into the base of the respiratory tree, the base of those, those lungs on both sides? Uh, nose breathing is something that in our Western culture, we forget it, how important it is from when you're exercising to remember to breathe through the nose to when you're sleeping to when you have a cold. Ultimately, nose breathing is what oxygenates us best um, as compared to mouth breathing. So just be extra aware when you're in your car, when you're, you're sitting at your desk, whatever it is, how are you breathing? Are you breathing through your nose, deeply into your lung fields? That's just the start, right? Ultimately, there's a lot of resources that can help with breath retraining from the Oxygen Advantage book to a, a book I'll mention on the next slide to breath work such as alternate nostril breathing. So if you haven't, uh, if you haven't heard of this book called Breath, uh, The New Science of the Lost Art, James Nestor is an anthropologist who kind of puts it all together, uh, how different cultures breathe, how humans have evolved to breathe the way they do and have the respiratory issues that they do these days to, from sleep apnea to, uh, to asthma. So this is an excellent stocking stuffer. I'll, I'll give you that tip. Um, if you want after the, after the doc talk, I would also recommend you just quickly type into YouTube the uh, Art of Living Yoga Alternate Nostril Breath just as a really quick way to get acquainted with how to breathe more evenly and use the respiratory tree as fully as we can. And this is kind of an Ayurvedic technique. So just dog mark that for yourselves after the, after the doc talk. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about ways to hack your nervous system. So just to recap from before, it's really important to regulate our nervous system outputs to regulate our stress hormones, including epinephrine and cortisol to have, give us more even energy level throughout the day. And some of the ways to do this are to find ways to de-stress and practice mindfulness, whether that's meditation or whether that's going for long walks in the woods. Um, spending some time in nature is a great way to reset and calm your nervous system on a physiological level. 
get seeking out regular chiropractic care, massage, acupuncture. Those are all great ways to work with your muscles and your nerves to regulate your nervous system. And activating your vagus nerve is a great way to address your autonomic balance. So in the autonomic nervous system, we have the sympathetic nervous system, which is kind of the young, um, active side of the nervous system that of the autonomic nervous system that is that allows us to respond to fight or flight. And then we have the yin aspect, which is the parasympathetic nervous system, and that allows us to rest and digest. And the um, the vagus nerve is cranial nerve 10. And it, as you can see on this diagram, affects all of our major organs and is a really important aspect of, of regulating that organ function. So some ways to act to, to, to sort of address the vagus nerve, to stimulate the vagus nerve is um, focusing on healthy digestion. So um, really focusing on eating meals at in a time where you're not stressed, um, that's going to improve your nutrient absorption and give you time to rest and digest. Um, cold exposure is a great way to kind of override your nervous system. So jumping in um, our gorgeous sound uh, ocean water that's nearby is a great way to kind of um, stimulate your vagus nerve and really kind of override any overactive brain activity that you're experiencing. Um, singing, humming, chanting, these are ways that humans have been engaging with one another and um, engaging our kind of sensual, the, our, the sensual aspects of ourselves for millennia. Um, and then we have auricular acupuncture is a great way to stimulate the vagus nerve. So the vagus ha only has one branch that comes um, out to our peripheral nervous system, and that is through the ear. And so often when there is that really strong stress component or an emotional component that folks are dealing with, I will use auricular acupuncture to address that in addition to whatever else is going on. So our fifth tip here is gonna be about food and we can't help ourselves as naturopaths. We always have to talk about food and food being our medicine here and our nutrition here coming in. So we already kind of established how important our B vitamins are for that cellular production of energy and same thing with calcium and magnesium. So we want foods that are high in B vitamins that have adequate calcium and magnesium. We want those high protein foods. And the reason for that is actually blood sugar stabilization. Cause we also talked about that um, blood sugar being a really important thing to regulate as our fuel. And then we have these antioxidants that can come in in the form of healthy fats and omega threes. So there are some specific dietary patterns that have been found to be very helpful for, um, our, for our energy production system. We know that if we can manage that blood sugar, I know I'm sounding like a broken record here, but it's something that we talk about so much with our patients. If we can find that stability in the blood sugar, then we have a stable input source of fuel for our cells. We also know that avoiding those higher carbohydrate foods. And here we are in the cookie season. Um, it's about to be, you know, there's just a lot of candy uh, that abounds this time of year. So trying to avoid that and really choosing those good quality uh, fat pro and protein rich foods as an option is preferable. We also want to make sure that we are staying hydrated and that comes down to that circulation piece once again. So we want to make sure that we're getting the fuel to be 
circulating to um, all the different parts of our body. We know that reducing inflammation in general, choosing a more anti-inflammatory diet, avoiding food coloring and different chemicals in our food, those can be very powerful in helping our cellular energy production as well. Intermittent fasting is such a fascinating one as well. And this is a dietary pattern where we're really choosing to avoid input of food for 12, 12 to 14, sometimes even longer hours a day. And so this is giving adequate time for our nutrients to come in and to be broken down properly. This also helps with that diurnal cycle. So we want to have, you know, breakfast, breaking the fast, but have it, having it be, um, at a period of time that you can look at your final meal of the day and trying to fit that within our 12 hours. So one of the tips I usually give to my patients who I think intermittent fasting might be appropriate for is I say, stop, uh, we will say like, stop snacking after dinner. So that's number one, that's our first um, step away. And the next thing we'll do is we'll move that dinner time up rather than being eight or even 7 p.m., which is pretty common um, for us Americans, pushing it up closer to that 5, 5.30, 6 p.m. if possible. And that helps us get that intermittent fasting time period in. It helps us regulate our blood sugar as part of that, and it helps with that mitochondrial um, cycle that's really important for the energy production. So foods we want to include are foods that are really anti-inflammatory, that are fueling for our system, that have those nutrients in them. So we're thinking about things like our good quality vegetables, our bone broth, our good quality fats, um, things like our fruit oils, like our avocado and coconut oil and olive oils, good quality um, meat and fish and poultry and eggs, if you're somebody who eats those types of foods, and also good quality um, uh, grains if you're somebody who can tolerate grains. On the opposite end are the things that we want to exclude. Now, these are our pro-inflammatory foods. Many of you guys know this, and we've already kind of touched on alcohol. So that's going to be disruptive for our blood sugar, but it's also going to affect our liver's ability to clean our bodies and increase our oxidation load, which makes it harder for our mitochondria to do its job. We want to stay away from those highly sugared substances because that's going to be really problematic as well. So that's our sodas or sweeteners, our, our fruit juices, the candies, those kind of things. Gluten grains can be really problematic for some people, as can dairy. If you know you, you tend to become inflamed from those foods, we'll want to reduce those. And we want to reduce all of the highly processed and packaged foods as well. Now, I want, wanted to make sure we um, had time to talk about my favorite uh, group of veggies, which is the cruciferous or brassica family of vegetables. And that's like the broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower family and kales in, in that as well. These are not only amazing sources of fiber, which help stabilize our blood sugar, but they also have these beautiful chemical antioxidants in them that really help reduce inflammation. And then they're really nutrient dense as well. As far as our cofactors go and our vitamins and minerals, they are just fabulous. So making sure we're including these in our diet is really important for our health when we're thinking about um, things like fatigue. Thanks, Dr. Molly. That leads us right into this next health hack, which is to hack your supplements. So ultimately, we're sort of circling back around to how do we support mitochondria with nutraceuticals? And that involves essentially antioxidants to protect their breakdown and cofactors and fuel to, to fuel the mitochondria. So this is just scraping the surface of how do we support the mitochondrial cells or, or aspects of all of the human cells, right? The ones that make energy for us. And glutathione is, is a huge one. It's a antioxidant that's specific for 
brain cells, protecting brain cells, and the, mit the mitochondria are really important in the brain because the brain needs a lot of energy, right? So brain protection is key as well here in supporting fatigue. Glutathione also helps our respiratory tree. Uh, it also helps our liver with detox. So this has kind of a three-pronged approach to being an antioxidant that supports and protects the mitochondria. Curcumin is a huge one. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's the active constituent in turmeric that is kind of our default systemic antioxidant, anti-inflammatory molecule that not only deals with supporting mitochondria, but also helps with aches and pains or GI things. You know, the list goes on with how helpful curcumin is. Sulforaphanes is, is new in my world, but it comes directly from that brassica family that Dr. Molly was talking about. It's a type of molecule that is also an antioxidant um, that's hugely supportive to the mitochondria because it contains that sulfur molecule in it, uh, which is very protective for those cells. And lastly, I added on here uh, one of my favorites, which is resveratrol, uh, an antioxidant found in, in red wine uh, and, and the skin of grapes. So not just wine, but basically our our fruits. <laughs> uh, and it's something that's been shown specifically, especially when there's a mitochondrial disorder, to help with rebuilding of those cells. So when we're thinking about the mitochondria and the powerhouse of the cell, we know that there are some supplements and nutraceuticals that we can use that have research behind them to actually produce more mitochondria, which is kind of amazing. So not only can we have, uh, add fuel to what the mitochondrial uses, but we can actually have the cells themselves produce more of the mitochondria themselves. So there's a substance called PQQ that's used for this. And there's some really cool research for um, for it. And it's something that we, we stock here at our dispensary. And I really like it, especially when people are running into these chronic fatigue syndromes and things like that to kind of get them back, um, back in working order, making sure that they have that cellular support for energy. We know from the research that estrogens can really be, a, a, have a big impact on how the mitochondria divide and in, increase. So we know that phytoestrogens, and these are things like flaxseed, and then there are some supplements as well that we use um, that are considered phytoestrogens as well as alfalfa. Those are some of our most potent ones. Um, and um, we can use these, to really help us, maca is another one, I'm just thinking, um, maca as well. We can use these to help improve our mitochondria if it's appropriate to have those extra supportive estrogens on board. Probiotics, so our good flora, is the other big missing piece here in our discussion so far. So we wanna make sure that we just acknowledge how important good, healthy gut flora and probiotics are and how they do impact mitochondria and and the, that mitochondria ability to um, increase in numbers. We also have this idea of fueling our mitochondria directly, and we've talked about these already, making sure that we have a good quality multivitamin or that we're getting these in our foods. These are kind of the, the different cofactors that we just want to make sure we think about. Sometimes it involves supplementing with a little extra calcium mag and magnesium for people, and that can make all the difference for energy. Okay, so when it comes to natural adrenal support, we have a number of, of supplements and strategies that help us really dampen that roller coaster ride of spiking cortisol, spiking epinephrine, and, um, and then crashing. That's the thing we want to avoid. So having a more even release and sustained energy throughout the day is our goal. So Things um, so uh, B complex um, and specifically vitamins B5 and B6, vitamin C, magnesium, omega 3s, and adaptogenic herbs are all ways that we can regulate cortisol production 
under stress. Um, so when we're having long periods of stress, we're regulating the extent to which we're releasing that cortisol so that it's around for longer and we can use it. So there's some, um, specifically, there's some adaptogenic herbs that we use often. Our major ones are Chinese and American ginseng, eleuthero, and ashwagandha. And these all work in different ways to regulate that cortisol production. So our final tip here today um, for our seven is going to be to really make sure that we are supporting our headspace. And so what that means is really tapping into the mental emotional component. And we want to think about, of course, um, finding things that bring us joy, maybe keeping a gratitude journal, engaging in meditation and prayer, making sure that we're taking time to connect in with nature, connecting in with our social structures and our community, and tapping into that idea of having purpose in life. There are also some really great um, meditation apps and things like that that are free and free videos online that can help out with, with that. And then also there are videos that can walk, through, walk people through EFT or emotional freedom technique, which is a series of tapping that you can do to kind of help clear your headspace and find your calm. So we're going to get into, I think, what is really exciting here, talking about some Eastern modalities for fatigue. If you guys can stay a little bit longer, I know we're running over, but this is some really exciting stuff. So Dr. Mary is going to talk about traditional Chinese medicine in regards to energy. So I'm an acupuncturist and traditional Chinese medicine herbal practitioner, in addition to being a naturopathic doctor. And I practice acupuncture and traditional Chinese herbal medicine at Prosper. And there's just so many amazing gems within this medicine in relationship to um, fatigue, but I'm going to try to distill it down here. <laughs> um, so traditional Chinese medicine is a traditional medicine system based on five elements and five major organs. Each of the five elements is connected with a major organ. And the goal of this medicine is to bring all of those five elements and organs into balance. We also have the concepts of qi, which is kind of the animating force that propels us and propels all of our physiologic functions. Blood, which is our kind of nutritive substance, um, very much related to the concept of blood we have in Western medicine. And then we have yin and yang. And as I was mentioning before, they are kind of opposing forces. Yang is our daytime active energy. Yin is our evening quiet, rejuvenative energy, and those we need to have in balance and they feed each other. So we can't, you know, what often happens with our cortisol, with our adrenal burnout is you're in yang, you're in yang, you're in yang, and you burn it all up. And then without getting, without using yin to restore that energy, you are in a depleted state. So through Chinese medicine, we're bringing those um, those different elements back into balance using acupuncture and herbal medicine. Um, when it comes to fatigue, it's often a really deficient state and we're, uh, our goal is to tonify those resources. And we typically do that mainly through herbal medicine. Um, some of our main patterns that we see are qi deficiency, yang deficiency, and blood deficiency. Um, and within qi deficiency or kind of a, a low amount of qi in the system, we, we often see spleen qi deficiency, which is related to digestion. So if you're having issues with digestion, it's really hard to absorb your nutrients properly and get those those energy fuels that you need to have consistent energy. 
And then kidney chi deficiency is often associated with aging. So as you age, your kidney chi declines, and that can obviously be related to, um, to hormones as well. So this, oh, going back to, yeah. So this is one of our major Chinese herbal medicine formulas. And it's one of our strongest tonifying formulas in that medical system. And it's called Sujun Zetang or Four Gentlemen Decoction. And it contains a number of great herbs, including red ginseng or ren shen. This is an adaptogenic herb, one of our primary adaptogens, and it's a very stimulating one. And from a Western medical perspective, it's been shown to regulate cortisol and um, epinephrine release and also regulate blood sugar levels. So that's some of the ways that it really helps us with fatigue. We also have Baiju, which is one that really stimulates the spleen chi. And again, all of that all of that energy production really begins in the gut and with healthy digestion and that is, um, and the spleen is associated with digestion. So Baiju is really um, supporting us in getting our nutrients from our food. And then we have Fuling, which um, is a mushroom that helps regulate, that sort of, that helps um, with water balance, it helps with, um, with water, with utilizing water throughout the body. And it's also an immunomodulatory herb that kind of helps us um, maintain a proper immune function also without overstimulating the immune system. And then we have jirgan sao, which is also known as honey, honey fried licorice. And that makes, makes it taste really yummy. And Licorice itself has a mild cortisol-like effect on our, on our system. So it binds to our endogenous cortisol receptors and gives us a lower level of a cortisol stimulation than, than the one we produce in our body. Um, so overall, this formula is used to tonify chi and strengthen the spleen when you're really feeling like your resources are depleted. Thanks, Dr. Mary, for that traditional Chinese perspective. From, you know, similar part of the world comes Ayurvedic medicine, which is traditional medicine of India, also a five element theory. And Ayurveda in Sanskrit means the science of life. Uh, so if you look at the top right there, it's got those three, three mind body types, also known as doshas. And these are the five elements reorganized uh, to sort of define life, essentially, from pathology to who you are uh, constitutionally, et cetera. That's kind of the basis of Ayurveda. When it comes to fatigue, however, we've got a whole lot of new Sanskrit terms here. The root cause is something known as low ojas, and ojas is your life force. It's like the chi in Chinese medicine. And low life force means you just don't have extra energy to give. Uh, it's being used up for, for your cellular function in it, 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 instead of being used to, to expand out ultimately. Uh, general treatment for fatigue involves boosting that ojas, the life force, also boosting your digestive fire, which is also known as agni. If you're not digesting well, you're creating something known as ama or toxins, right? So that toxic buildup, similar to the naturopathic things we're talking about, leads to fatigue it's, and inflammation. It's difficult for the body to process through that. So boosting our digestive fire helps dealing with ama. And lastly, this concept of rasayanas, which is just a Sanskrit term for tonics. So we've got to tonify all of the tissues if we're going to, going to deal with fatigue. So to increase ojas, that life force, it involves 
both diet and lifestyle uh, therapies. So restorative yoga is kind of where we start instead of, you know, trying to train for a marathon, right? Uh, and stress management is also huge. It takes a ton of energy, it's quite inflammatory to be chronically stressed. <laughs> so breath work helps with, with that piece there. And then to boost your OGES, you want to also have a nutritive diet, not one that is full of stimulants, uh, sugars, alcohol, things that cause the blood sugar to, to really uh, be on a roller coaster. And focus on the anti-inflammatory foods, the antioxidants found in all of our fruits and veggies, ultimately. To increase Agni, our digestive fire, uh, here's where Ayurveda recommends regular fasting. And like Dr. Molly mentioned, intermittent fasting is something we see that's helpful for the mitochondria. So it's sort of East meets West here in the recommendation. Avoiding snacks and big hard to digest meals is just another way of, of making sure the Agni, that digestive fire stays stoked rather than just dampened with all the food we're adding. And then, as you know, with Indian cooking, it is well spiced with warming spices. Nothing is bland. And that's because it has to do with stoking that internal digestive fire. To decrease ama, those toxins build up. Uh, there's a whole, whole bunch of recommendations involving which foods, are supposed to be eaten alone or in combination. Ultimately, the take home point here with Ayurveda is just if we're eating dairy with tomatoes, for example, or milk with lemons, it curdles, right? We see that outside of the body when we're trying to make paneer at home or, or farmer's cheese. So the same thing happens inside the body those two types of foods, the acids and the bases, really need to be separate uh, to avoid buildup, to avoid curdling. Uh, Panchakarma is another sort of Ayurvedic specific cleanse um, to help with detox, to kind of help push the reset button. And there's, you know, this is a concept that, uh, you know, we hear about in Western medicine as well. Um, so something to consider come, come January. And then lastly, the Rasayanas are huge here. So adding those in, those are tissue building tonics. And when we talk about adding those in from the herbal world, it has to do with our adaptogens. And the adaptogens are a type of herb that helps us modulate stress. Uh, and the big one in Ayurveda is something known as Chaivan Prash. It's the sort of jelly that's made from amla berry, uh, our highest source of vitamin C uh, in, in nature. And uh, it's well spiced and it's something that kids, you know, Indian families will just give, give to their kids on the daily to sort of boost, boost the tissue building and tonify the organs. And lastly, the huge one is ashwagandha, as we've heard of before, our big Ayurvedic adaptogen here. So something I just want to make you aware of is that we're having a bonus doc talk next month, that first week in January at noon, uh, that first Tuesday. And it's just going to be all about Ayurvedic medicine where you know, if you want to know more about this, this amazing Eastern modality, this is sort of your chance to, to chime in and, 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 uh, and, and learn, learn a little bit. Um, yeah, learn the basics, uh, essentially. So I'll walk you through what the Ayurvedic doshas are, you'll be able to go home and sort of assess yourself. Uh, we'll do some basic nutrition, Ayurvedic nutrition things, as well as lifestyle practices. And you'll have the tools to go home and assess for your own Agni, your own Ojas, and your own Ama buildup. So just wanted to clue you into that. That's a free session on January 4th. 
So we're excited to announce our new um, Doc Talk schedule for the new year, and we will make sure to have registration links to these on our website here in this next week. So we'll get that one up for the Ayurvedic talk that will be on the fourth, and we're really excited to offer that then because, you know, with the new year comes the new you. It's a, a great time to really focus in on your health goals. And we want to just give you guys as much information as we can. On the 12th of January, we're going to be talking about the microbiome. That's a huge uh, talk topic. And one of my favorites is a microbiologist. I just think it's so cool. Um, but we hope you will join us for both of those. And once again, we'll have registration links on our website for that. Um, so do, do look for those and we'll send out emails as well. So, and if you guys have any um, questions that came up about today's talk, or if you feel like you wanna dig in a little bit deeper about what might be going on for you with your own energy levels, please contact us. Um, our phone number's right there. You can go online and request an appointment that way as well. We're seeing people both in person and via telemed at this point. Um, and we would be you know, thrilled to work at, work with you. Um, helping people regain their energy is one of the most satisfying um, components that we get uh, the, the pleasure of doing. So 